AP Physics 1 students, great to see you guys. It's Mr. Heinrich, and we're looking at Unit 5 FRQ2 from the AP Classroom Progress Checks. Let's get into it. A non-uniform bar is attached to a wall by a fixed pivot at its left end, as shown in Figure 1. The bar has length L and mass M. Its mass is distributed such that the bar's center of mass is a distance L divided by 3 from the bar's free end, and the bar's rotational inertia about the pivot is 1 half ML squared. A string is attached to the wall and the bar as shown, holding the bar horizontal. The bar is shown again in figure two and the dots in the figure are located at the point of attachment for the string and the bar's center of mass. So this is where the string is attached and this is the center of mass. So part A, we're doing a free body diagram. We're gonna draw all of the forces acting on this system. All right, there's the system they had for us and we know at the center of mass, there has to be a gravity. That's where gravity is acting. So we'll put FG here. And I'll make it about that long. Now tension, on the other hand, which acts along this string, I'm going to make even longer. And there's a reason for that. So why did I draw tension so much longer than I drew gravity? Well, gravity is trying to produce a clockwise torque. And it would be FG times that lever arm, which is 2 thirds L. So tension, even if I took the Y component and I had FTY here, it has a much shorter lever arm, which would be L divided by 3. So I need a much bigger force from tension for that counterclockwise torque to balance out this clockwise torque. And that's why tension is quite a bit longer than gravity. But these are not the only two forces. Because as gravity is trying to do this, and tension is trying to do this, this bar is touching the wall and putting pressure against the wall. Now I just talked about the Y component of FT, and you need to see that that is quite a bit bigger than gravity. So when we're thinking about the forces up equal the forces down, because this is a static system, then you must also have a pivot force that looks something like that. Meaning that as this bar touches the wall, the wall responds with a force downward. So again, the reason this is angled down is because if you can imagine that Y component acting downward plus that gravity, those two would have a length downward that is about as equal as FTY is in the upward direction. Yes? Okay, moving on. Part B, starting with Newton's second law in rotational form, derive an expression for the bar's angular acceleration immediately after the string is cut. Express your answer in terms of L, M, and physical constants as appropriate. Begin your derivation by writing either a fundamental physics principle or an equation from the reference book. Okay, here's our setup. We have given to us L, M, and G. We're looking for angular acceleration. We have Newton's second law in rotational form. We already know gravity is going to try to produce a clockwise torque because it's acting with a lever arm two-thirds L. Okay, what else? Well, there's also the torque of friction. They told us that was 1 12th MGL. And if you're having trouble visualizing what this looks like, think about the axle. If you could blow this up and actually look at it, you would see, oh, there's the axle, and there is a little lever arm, and there is a force of friction acting up, and that force times that lever arm would be that frictional torque. That must be a counterclockwise torque because it is opposing the clockwise gravitational torque. Okay, that was a little extra for you. Let's keep moving. So torque net would be my torque of gravity minus my torque of friction equal to I times alpha. And don't forget, I is equal to one half ML squared. All right, from here, I'm going to plug in my torque of gravity, and that would be my force of gravity times the lever arm two thirds L minus my torque of friction one twelfth MGL equals my rotational inertia, one-half ml squared, times the thing I'm looking for, alpha. m is in every single term. I'm going to cross it out. There is an l in every single term, but keep in mind these two get crossed out, and only one of these gets crossed out. And what else can I do? Well, I'm solving for alpha, and I've got all these fractions. Personally, I like to multiply every fraction by the lowest common factor, which is 12 in this case. So if I multiply this one by 12, I get 8G. I'm going to put the G behind the constant. Minus G equals 6L alpha. Cool. We're going to solve for alpha, but first we're going to subtract these two, which would give us 7G. And we're going to divide by the 6L. And there it is. All right, moving on to part C. 
Okay, here's part C, and remember the situation. We cut the string and the bar swings downward. And what it's asking for, all of that verbiage is saying, what's going on with angular acceleration during that cut and then rotation? Well, think about it like this. When you drop something, immediately it has an acceleration of negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So the second you cut that string, it's immediately undergoing an angular acceleration, and it's pretty big. But as it rotates down, the gravity is no longer producing a torque because if my bar is down and my gravity is like this, the line of action from gravity goes directly through the pivot and it produces no more torque. Therefore, there would be no more angular acceleration. So I already know my beginning point has to be here, a pretty big positive angular acceleration because we're talking about the clockwise direction. Clockwise is given as positive. So it's going to be a positive angular acceleration that gives way to a zero angular acceleration once that bar went from zero degrees to 90 degrees. So having those two locations is huge, but you might think it's a straight line and it's not. It's actually a curved line that looks something like what my cursor is doing right now. So that's the answer. If you think you got it, you can move ahead to the next part. But if you want the justification, I'm going to do that right now. So here's the justification for C. Good for you for wanting to know, because that way you can approach other questions that are just like this one. I'll try to make MG the same length at every picture that I have. All right, there we go. First and foremost, you can see this MG right here is acting at this lever arm. And let's just call it R instead of 2 thirds L. It'll make things easier. So there's R. And here's the same exact R and the same exact R all the way down through the pictures. Well, you can see that once we get to the second picture, it's no longer MG completely that is producing the torque. It's actually MG cosine theta times that R right there, right? You have your force that is perpendicular to your lever arm, R. By the way, there's the theta. What is happening to that mg cosine theta component as you continue to swing down? It's getting shorter and shorter. You can see that this one is shorter than that one was. And there's our angle theta right there. Maybe that's 30 degrees, maybe that's like 60 degrees, and maybe that's 90 degrees. So as our angle increases, mg cosine theta decreases. And that mg cosine theta doesn't just decrease linearly, it actually decreases exponentially, which is why I talked about drawing that curve that looked like this, right? If that was alpha and that was zero alpha, we'd have a big torque right here producing a big angular acceleration. But then by the time we got here, we'd have zero. So if I was to plug in cosine of zero and then cosine of 15 and then cosine of 30 and then cosine of 45, cosine of 60, cosine of 75, cosine of 90, you would see a pattern in your answers that was not linear. We would have a reduction in our cosine theta value that was reducing exponentially like that. So I hope that makes sense. On to the next part. All right, last part, part D. We've got this bar that's been returned to its original horizontal position. Another string is then attached to the bar, as shown in figure four. This time the string is attached to the bar so that it's lined up with the center of mass. The string is also attached to a higher location on the wall so that it is oriented at the same angle as the original string. D is saying, other than the force exerted by the string, indicate how a force represented in the diagram you drew for part A would change, if at all, with the second string attached to the bar and wall as in figure four. If there would be no changes to any other forces, state this explicitly, justify your answer. And there's definitely gonna be some changes. So I figured it would be easier just to show you the difference between the two drawings. And here's the big difference. So I figured it would be easier to just show you the two pictures side by side. That's the old situation, that's the new situation. What's different? Well, tension here was a lot longer than it is here, and FP was at a downward diagonal, and now FP is completely horizontal. And why is that? We need to be able to justify that in our answer. So I would say this, get ready to write. The force of tension is reduced, period. Since tension's attachment point is further down the bar, there is a longer lever arm, period. With a longer lever arm, tension does not need to be as great 
in order to produce the same counterclockwise torque that would balance out gravity's clockwise torque, period. Finally, given that the Y component of tension will be equal to gravity, there is no longer a need for the pivot force to act at an angle, which means that the pivot force acts in the horizontal axis only, period. And that's it. But I would include this picture so that the reader knows what you mean by all your words, because that's a lot of verbal to go with a whole lot of visual. All right, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, make sure you ring that bell, and I'll talk to you on the next one. Have a great day. See you later.